Ellen Meredith, warm welcome to Live Synergy. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and so happy to meet you and meet all of the members of your club and audience. You have understood this is foremost a book club with people yes. devoted and super interested in the body mind spirit segment. So Perfect. and this is why we meet you because you are just about to get launched in Sweden with this book the energy dialogue in english you could say but the original translation the, the original title is what do you say is the language your body speaks energy medicine oh gosh what is it self healing with energy medicine so sorry <laughs> yeah that's right that's right and we actually wanted to call it energy dialogen and that's because you you use that term in the book quite often the energy dialogue it's a dialogue right. with a language right right and so. i use the term it's kind of a a name for a concept that we can heal ourselves by dialoguing with our own energies our own subtle energies okay because we're made of energy right our body operates using energy you know communicates with itself and our mind and spirit using energy and then we fuel everything in our life with energy so if we can begin to participate in these dialogues that are happening between body mind spirit and these energy dialogues that are happening if we can learn that language and speak it we have a better way to participate in our own creation of self it sounds you know heavenly <laughs> to get there so tell us a little bit more about the language the language of energy that you talk about okay okay well in our culture we tend to think of energy in, in real scientific terms okay we talk about neutrons and protons and all of all that science stuff and and that's interesting but when i talk about energy i talk about motive force the thing that makes you and me alive that's energy it, it's 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 a function of our consciousness and energy the subtle energies that make us up and that run the body are intelligent they're not just they're not just pulses and vibrations they're actually part of the consciousness that creates me and you so the language of energy is basically how do these communications happen and to receive the communications we it's not a special psychic sense necessarily although some of us have wonderful psychic powers it's actually your everyday senses your hearing your seeing your feeling you know your touch your smell you know all of the senses and then some extended senses such as your ability to perceive when something is out of balance or your ability to recognize patterns we have a lot of senses that we don't name at least in english we we talk about the five senses in english but really there's a lot more that's all part of that receptive ability to to perceive the language so if i want to speak with my body i and i speak english to it it may or may not understand or swedish right but if i can speak with an image or with touch or with a color um with a gesture my body understands that because that's part of the the language that the that that is um that energy uses for the communication between mind body and spirit oh. so, so we can learn this language or do you have to have well you said that we don't need to have a psychic ability or something like that but right we learn this language. yes and absolutely we all we already know it right yeah. i mean you can't you can't walk through a crowd and i mean when you walk through a crowd and you don't run into people you're using your energy sensing very strongly um you know because you're using your radar you're using your vision you're using your ears we use it all day every day but we're we're not taught what we're doing we're not taught to recognize the language that we use the language of perception 
and the language of communication. So I'm communicating with you. I'm in the US, you're in Sweden. We're, we're going through, through the Zoom right now. We're looking at each other. There's lots of visual cues, there's sound cues, but there's also an energetic exchange, an additional energetic exchange. I'm, I'm kind of feeling your energies and your personality and, and the vibe, vibration. You're feeling mine, you're, you're the people watching, they're saying, oh, who are these people? And we have a much broader vocabulary of perception and understanding and communication than just the words in the language, in you know, in the, in the spoken language. But how can you trust the 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 energy that you're feeling? I mean, I could I could have a, an idea of this energy or an energy <clears throat> between me and someone else, or the energy in my body. But how can I learn to trust that? Well, the same way you learned to trust the words in the the set in the sentence that you just said. When you think about a young child learning language from the beginning, how do they trust that, that, you know, a ball is a ball, you know, they interact with it, they bounce it, they roll it, they throw it to someone and see if they'll throw it back. They feel it, they taste it, they interact with it every which way and they become to, they form a concept. Oh, this object is called a ball. And what we do with it has names and, and we build up that sense of language. And we're all born with the with the ability to learn language. Otherwise, people wouldn't be understanding me right now, right? We're born with the capacity, but we have to learn the language. It doesn't, we don't come out of our mother's womb speaking fluent Swedish or, or English. It's that same ability to learn and test and experiment that you use with the language of energy, which includes what you pick up with all your senses. So if I see something, either with my literal eyes or in my mind's eye, I can ask someone else, what do you see? Mm -hmm. I can go closer and feel it. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, listen and see if my ears pick up the same information or my inner ears. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I talk about inner vision and inner ears, it's like if you think of your mother, shut your eyes a moment and think of your mother. Okay, most of us can sense her, whether it's, a visual, hear her voice, just an overall um, thought of her. That's also part of the perceptual language. It's the inner version of our, our sensing. So how do you learn it? You learn it by using it. You learn it by tuning in over and over. And that's where energy dialogue comes in. And this book. And this book. And this book, because I'm teaching you in the book how to use the language of energy and, and just how it works as we construct a self. How do our energies work to construct this this thing that we are in this dimension, right? And so um, it's it's a matter of learning first of all to ask different questions, especially if you want to use energy medicine for healing. And the book is focused a lot on self-healing with energy medicine, um, we have to ask better questions. We usually say, what's wrong and how do I fix it? Okay. <laughs> well, that's, you know, if you're going to ask what's wrong, you're going to get a whole lot of information about what's wrong. And it's, it's going to strengthen and strengthen the notion of this is wrong. This is wrong. If you ask, what do I need in this moment? Or give me insight into what's going on in this moment we get to dig a little more into the dynamics and the awareness of what's happening or what's needed, what I want to call in. Mm -hmm. You know, we might better ask what's right in this moment, because that's going to emphasize energetically. It's going to tell your body to fund what's right yeah. rather than you know, focusing on what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we have to look at what's wrong. I mean, you know, if I have an illness, I do have to dive into it a little. But I can dive into what is this illness saying to me? What what is my body communicating to me right now through these symptoms? Mm -hmm. And when we can get into that realm of communicating back and forth, not just one question. The other thing is we want the diagnosis, right? We want the yeah. name of what's wrong. Mm -hmm. But 
most of us know, hey, yes, I've got a cold, and that's the name for what's wrong. But really, I worked too hard for four weeks. I stayed out too late. I didn't feed myself right for, for about a week. And then, you know, I was like, had my face right up close to someone with a cold. And this was my way of getting time out from my work. So the cold is much more than just either the germs or the name. And if we have 10 colds, they're all really different energy states, even though they all have the same name in Western medicine. So we begin to say this cold was about needing a time out, whereas this cold was my body got overwhelmed by stress. And this cold was about uh, wanting to keep people at a distance. So we begin to get much more uh, attuned to what's really happening and not just um, diagnosis and treatment. Yeah, makes sense. And that's what language does for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's what language does. It's, it's not science. I mean, if you want to understand a great author, you don't want science to analyze it. You want, you want to analyze it using other tools, the tools of understanding how language works and, and what, what it expresses in different, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just saying we need to evolve this, this language because it really is. It's not a scientific phenomenon. Our energy can be described through science, but it's not a scientific phenomenon. It's, it's, it's the art of living and it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a language phenomenon. I know that you are a kind of a, a, a language nerd and I say that with love, and <laughs> I'm also a language nerd. <laughs> so, so, and when with language, it's quite concrete and you can almost, you know, feel it. Right. Um, how how is the la the the energy language? Uh, is it also concrete? C can it become concrete for you? Yes, absolutely. It can become so concrete that you feel it the way you would hear a paragraph in Swedish and understand what's going on. You know, mm -hmm. as you work with it as you practice it. I mean, it is our mother tongue. It is our original language, the language of energy. We learn it as babies before we learn our spoken language. If, if we don't have the language of energy, we can't learn a spoken language, right? Because if I say, I throw you the ball, if you don't understand the energy of what's happening, of the object, of what happens when I do this, of the movement of the object, of your role in it, you can't understand that sentence, no, right? That's true. Yeah. So we've learned the language of energy already. It's just that our culture, you know, our trained brain, um, just X's it out. We're not. We're taught not to notice that we are perceiving all the time. We need to. That, it sounds like we need to. How how should I explain that? It sounds like we need to to look at the energy at a, from a different perspective. Right, right. And that's what I try to do in the book is shift it from the science of energy yeah. to the language of energy because we all speak at least one language fluently. Mm -hmm. And so we can put take everything we know about language and bring it to this language, which is our first language of energy. and. When I say it can be concrete, when you get really good at perceiving energies, you can tune into your body and and even see what's happening with the bones and the and the um, tendons and the blood. And, you know, you can go very deeply into how energy and form interrelate by by learning to um, develop your, you know, your ear for it, your your ability to perceive it. And, you know, I, I, I did that last night. A friend of mine fell down and broke her hand and I was in there kind of helping to repair the bone energetically. And why? Because when, when every time a, we, we get an injury, okay, and it forms a scar, well, we all know that the cells of our body replace themselves pretty much every seven years. Now, some quicker and some longer, but pretty much after seven years, all new cells, why do you still have a scar there? Mm -hmm. Because there's a message saying, re re 
rebuild the scar, leave that scar there. It's an experience and it's, it's marked on this body. If you can go in and change the messaging of how the body makes new cells or replicates itself, it can heal anything. So that's, that's more advanced energy language. But the beginning is just learning what is my body telling me, you know, if I have a headache, not what you want to say, what's going on in my body that it's calling to me, it's, it's signaling with this headache. And how can I receive the message and respond appropriately? <laughs> and so when how we would you actually do that, would you <clears throat> go into um, um, meditation or would you do you have you know, some kind of procedure to get into the right well I have the book is chock full of exercises of how to do that I you know I love meditation and I've worked with oh thousands over 10,000 people over the years and a good number of them can't meditate they just can't they can't sit still they can't focus or they don't it doesn't go with who they are. So I really believe that <clears throat> that just like, if I say tune into your hand, mm -hmm. okay, tune into your hand a moment. You can move it, you can touch it, you can gesture with it, you can blow on it, blow on it. Okay, even send your tension in, see if you can feel muscles and bone, just see what you can feel in there or perceive. You can shut your eyes and picture this stuff. Some people who can't picture just think bone, muscle, you know, they have the words. All of us know how to bring our attention to our hand. Take a moment, feel your hand now. See how much attention and awareness is there because you brought your attention to your hand. Okay? Yeah. We know how to do this. It's not rocket science. It's something we do in other ways. I'm just showing people how to bring that kind of attention to the body and the mind and the spirit as they as they have their conversations so that you can perceive them. So if I tune in and say, well, what's your hand doing? You know, describe what you're feeling in your hand right now. Can you? Yeah, I can, I can sense a, a certain tension in part of my palms and um, the stretchiness, uh, like my, my fingers are not you know they feel a little bit cramped um okay <clears throat> I, some sense of uh, chill here and warmth here uh-huh okay so why don't with your other hand make up some kind of gesture to help remove the tension from your hand or calm it you know it could be a calming gesture or a pulling out gesture, something that helps to calm that tension you're feeling. Okay, can you feel a shift at all? Yeah. Okay, what about a color? What color is in there and what color does it wanna be? It's yellow and orange. It is yellow and orange or it wants to be yellow it and orange? It is yellow and orange. And, it, and it, I think it wants to be a warm color. Okay. So can you, can you breathe in and as you exhale, just fill that hand with a warm color that it wants right now? What color does it have now? No, it's still yellow and orange because I think that's warm colors, but a bit more even. Okay. Yeah, so it's not just part yellow, part orange. It's more. Okay, so orange. it in integrated color. Yeah. And now if, um, let's see, if you had a sound, I don't know if you're co comfortable with sound, but if you wanted to sing a note or a song to that hand. Is there a note? I'll sing one to mine. I'm not shy. <clears throat> a lot of people are shy about sound, but sound heals. So, uh, uh, people can do this with us. Uh, uh, 
Okay, so we can use sound. We can use, um, we've done gesture, we've done touch, we've done color, we've done sound. You can place, if you wanted to place an object in that hand that is a gift, what, what would you give? And it doesn't have to be a literal, it can be an, an imaginary object, but what as a gift would you give to your hand in this moment? A heart. Okay, so take a heart. You can either draw the heart on your hand or you can imagine you're taking a heart and putting it in your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, how's that feel? Feels good. Yeah. We're just having energy dialogue. We're using the vocabulary of the language of energy to dialogue. And we're, we're, you know, we're going in and out between tuning in and seeing what it needs or wants or what's there and supplying things and saying, how about this? How about that? Does this feel good? Does this, does this help? Is this supportive? And the whole body has a built in guidance system to show us how to do this work you know you you didn't have trouble knowing what you wanted because no. i wasn't asking you come up with the right answer for all time right i was inviting you in this moment to play mm -hmm. with your energies and your energies showed you what they wanted or what was going on or mm -hmm. you know gave you feedback mm -hmm. that that's the essence of energy at dialogue right there so I know that you had um, have like a pain in your arm. Yeah, yeah. I have an injury. I, I, this is a sports injury. I'm so proud. I have a sports injury because I'm not very sportif. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I went out to play pickleball, which is, a, you know, it's very popular here. It's for old people, right? And I'm thinking, okay, white hair. I better play pickleball. And so I went out for the first time to play pickleball, and I lunged for a ball, and I fell very hard on my knees and my hands and I sprained this hand. I took off the bandage so it wouldn't look so so pathetic. But um, so I yeah, I have pain. I have a big bruise here. I sprained uh, my tendon uh, in my thumb in here and um, and uh, yeah, some other things. But it's at this point it's a it's a week old so it's a, and i've got a lot of tight muscles everywhere where all the muscles got jammed and so i've been working on on that so how are you working on that okay well it goes into another realm i haven't written this book yet though i have it in a dvd form it's called energy cairo it's a it's a form of energy work that i invented but basically i'm communicating with everything so i go in and i can see or feel whether a bone is broken or not. And if I can't feel it, I can go for an X-ray or a PET scan. It, it's not cheating to use Western medicine. In this case, I've got a lot of experience. I could tell the bone wasn't broken, but I could tell that there was a tear in this tendon here. So I've been like putting different messaging. I've been taking the message of really healthy tendon and just spreading it over my tendon so that again the cells as they replicate as they as they replace themselves replace themselves with healthy tendon not ripped tendon mm -hmm. i've been calming the muscles and i put blue goo in there cuz it's very uh relaxing it it it's it calms inflammation so i've been bringing energetic mm -hmm. material in to calm it I keep asking my body, what do you need right now? Do you need rest? Do you need movement? Do you need water? Do you need a particular food? And I let it guide me to show me what it needs in order to heal. And when you say that, huh? when you say that it, uh, it strikes me that normally we want to have some kind of direction from a doctor or someone, okay, tell me what to do. So right. what you're saying is more feel what you need right take care of yourself be kind to yourself listening right. to your body right and ask the question we ask the doctor what's wrong with me we don't ask ourselves what do i need in this moment what would be healing in this moment what's what what color does my hand want in this moment what what song does my hand want to hear in this moment what 
again, what can, gift can I give my hand or what, what gift can my hand give me in this moment? That's another part of the dialogue. It's, 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 it's a back and forth. And as we dialogue with our body and our mind and our spirit and between them, they become very, very good friends. And you know how when you love someone and when you get to know them over time, they don't need to tell you a lot about what's going on. You can pick up yeah. what's happening. Yeah, that's true. Or you have a vocabulary for hearing, like if you say, you, okay, for one friend, I say, what's going on? And they'll tell me. I have another <laughs> friend I have to ask at least four times before she'll tell me anything real. Yeah. So I'll say, well, no, really, but what's happening? And I keep asking until I get something real because I know that friend has a lot more protection around her. Yeah. And I still love her. I just have to work differently to communicate. So we need to know, <clears throat> each of us, how do I communicate with this body, with this mind, with this spirit, and how do I ask better questions than the doctor asks or what I'm asking the doctor? Because the doctor is focused on where's the pathology, what's wrong, and how am I gonna help, how am I gonna fix this? And often the fix is very invasive. It's, it's a chemical messaging. Mm -hmm. And the body does speak chemistry and it speaks energy. The energies can influence your chemistry, but your chemistry doesn't necessarily heal your energies. So when I take a pill, it might tell my muscles to relax or it, it might bring the inflammation down. And there's nothing wrong. That's not cheating. But I'm still not listening and getting the full communication. So the, the, the presence and awareness I hear is important here. Right. And it's a little like meditation in action. It's not sitting quiet on a cushion and, and doing it that way. It's using language as a meditation tool. It's so important that you say that because I was just thinking about that. It's like, you know, you can, you can meditate on a color or you can meditate on, you know, yeah, everything right. that we did with the, my hand. Right. And, but you're actually doing it awake and, you know, yeah. Right. And I want to put it another way. If you have a young child, you don't ask your child to meditate on a color. You give them paints and say, play with these colors. Here's yeah. paper. Here's paints. What do you want to do? Yeah. And we've lost that sense of play. And yet that's how you learn language. You play with things and you explore experiment and you use them in a context and we lose that sense of using our own energies in a context we're we're up here in our brain wanting the right answers and what's what's the right way to do things and what's what's the truth here and and we we look outside ourselves for authority rather than getting that authorship that authority that's inside of us and again, I don't reject experts. They have a lot to offer, but they aren't necessarily inside my body, mind, and spirit creating my life. So what am I trying to create here? And what do I need to do it more effectively? I well, mean, looking at all the people that go to the doctors with very abstract, diffuse symptoms, it's, I mean, First and all, when you come and see the doctor, you kind of feel a little bit off trying yes. to explain to him or her because right. you know that whatever comes out of my mouth is not concrete enough for him to understand what I right. actually feel. Right. So, and you have to do it in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. No, five. <laughs> five. Okay, whatever you've got in your system, ours is 10 or 15. And you have to do it out of context. Yeah. If the doctor came to your house, you could, you could say, in this room, I'm not myself. In this room, I'm okay. They could see who's around you and they could see quite right away, oh, it's your husband, it's not you at all, you know, or, or whatever, you know, they could see the whole context. It's only our culture that thinks that they can figure out what's wrong by pulling you totally out of context putting you in a sterile room with no color on the walls, neither of you wearing 
what you want to wear. I mean, you're wearing an embarrassing paper gown and they're not wearing clothes that they're comfortable with usually. And we we try to understand illness and wellness in a in a bizarre setting. Yeah, that's true. If you're a shaman or so, a, a traditional healer, everything, what is the person's spiritual practice? What is their, how do they interact with the people who love them or hate them? Who loves them and hates them? Where do they fit in their community? How do they use their body moment to moment, day by day? How do, what, what do they eat? How do they eat? Um, and what kind of access to food? I mean, the shaman or the natural healer has access to the context in which this body, mind, and spirit are operating. And the doctor doesn't find out about any of that. Yeah. You, you know, if if you went in and said, doctor, I, you know, I've had this horrible stomach ache and by the way, I can't pray and I used to be able to pray and I really miss my my connection to the divine. They'd say, well, that's not my that's not my realm. I'll give you a pill for your stomach. Go see your priest. Right. <laughs> that's true. And if we chop ourselves into these little bits, then we don't have the agency to understand that they're all interconnected that my connection to my source is an important thing that fuels me and feeds me. So if my digestion digestion is not working, that's part of my digestion system. Tell us, how did you end up with energy medicine? What's your story? Okay, well, um, I, I'm trying to think where to start. Years and years ago in my early 20s. So almost uh, actually a little earlier than that, I started hearing my inner teachers. I started feeling connection to inner guidance, my inner teachers. And it happened because first my grandmother showed up and my grandmother was dead at the time. She's still dead, but she was dead. And she came to me and she gave me a message. And I was a writer and I'm a writer. So I wrote it down and thought this is a wonderful message from my grandmother. And um, I didn't believe in psychic stuff necessarily. I didn't know anything about it, but I thought, well, I imagined grandma. But the next day, somebody came to my door who I barely knew. And she said, I'm going to a psychic fair. Do you want to come with me? And I said, yeah, sure. Okay. Never, never been to one of those. And I went to the psychic fair and the psychic I sat down and the psychic looked at me and she said, your maternal grandmother is standing right behind you and she has a message for you. And then she repeated the exact message I had gotten from my grandmother, wow. you know, and that woke me up. It was like, wait, I said, and you know, I was kind of a brat then I was pretty young. I said, well, she already said that. Doesn't she have anything new to say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Grandma. Anyway, um, the psychic. I said, "How did you do that? Did you read my mind, or is it, do you think my grandma's really there?" And the psychic said, "Well, I believe it's my belief system that your grandmother is there in spirit. I can hear her, and you can hear her too. And if you slow down and listen, you'll be able to hear your your inner guides, your inner teachers." So I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And the next day I was sort of just not doing much. And I noticed in my brain, this ticker tape, like at the stock market with, it was, you know, a tape with letters on it. So I went to my typewriter because this was before computers and I typed the letters that I was seeing on this tape. And it was a message from my inner teachers, my inner guides. And I called them my counsels. And they basically said they were going to work with me and gave me some instructions. And they interpreted a dream that I had and all of that. So I started working with them every day. And they came not just letter by letter. I started to just hear them and write what they had to teach me. And then at one point, they said, you're going to be moving to California. You're going to get very ill. And in the process of healing, you're going to learn how to be a healer. And that happened. I, you know, I, I heard in that whole story, what I heard is California, <laughs> right? Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Hey. California, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I did move to California. This was some years after I had first started working with my counsels. I moved to California and I did get quite ill mm -hmm. and I went to see my doctor and the doctor, bless her heart, said, I can't help you. 
I can't help what you have, but I'm going to send you to a chiropractor who does applied kinesiology and works with meridians and energies. Can so I, I went to pause a, 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 because you have some of that in here too with meridians and a, a bit of Chinese, Chinese medicine, right? Yes. Yes. There's a, it's rooted in some of that Chinese medicine stuff, yeah. the, the meridians. That's, that was my first introduction to a system of working with energies. Or one so of my first, I, I had yeah. another one, but that was it. Anyway, so what happened was that when I was um, working with that chiropractor, I discovered I could see what was going on in my own energies. That when she went to test something with what's called muscle testing, I already knew what the answer was going to be because I could feel it or see it. So it was a wonderful training in testing, testing my perceptions. Now, not everyone has that opportunity, but everyone has the opportunity opportunity to ask a friend, what do you see? What do you perceive? Or ask three friends, maybe form a group and practice perceiving things together. And you're going to find over time that you're both accurate and on the same page a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into it. When I healed, the, the chiropractor said, can you do this for other people? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> so she said, well... Yeah, right. Who knew? Right. I thought it was weird already. So she said, um, well, can can you come in? I have a couple uh, patients that I'm stuck. I can't I don't know what to do. So I came in and the first one had a hairline fracture in her neck. I saw it in her vertebrae. And I said, you know, and her, her neck wasn't healing. And I said, well, would it make a difference if there's a little fracture there? And the chiropractor said, yeah, duh. Yeah. And so did a. Um, and took the x-ray with, you know, looked at it more closely and found the fracture. And then it started from there. I worked as a medical intuitive in her office. And that was, that was wonderful training. And then clients just started coming. They just, I mean, word of mouth. I never needed to advertise because just they came and came and came. And within a year, I had, I had, a, I taught at a university at that point. I was teaching writing at a university. I had to choose between my, my, writing career, my teaching of writing and this new energy medicine career. And so I thought, well, this is more interesting and creative. So I went in with the, the energy medicine and I've been doing it ever since. So this is your born talent kind of some well, are psychic, some are, <clears throat> yeah, you can. Um... I, I'm going to say it comes out of my talent for language. Yeah. Because I learned a lot of, I was a language nerd yeah. and I learned a lot of languages. I mean, I studied at least 13 languages by the time I was in my mid twenties. I just, I, I just thought they were so interesting. I just kept studying and studying. You know, I don't know them all today. Some, they start falling out the back after a while when you put a new one in. That's where Norwegian came in. Yes. Yes. That's how I learned, you know, I learned Norwegian in those days um, as well. And a little bit of Swedish and Danish too. Um, yeah, because I just loved language. And so that's why I know that you can learn the language of energy. I know that everybody listening knows the language of energy, but can learn it because you're understanding my words. And it's the same skill set as learning a language, it's just different vocabulary. Okay. You know how you can watch someone do sign language? I'm faking it. I don't know sign language, but you know, you see them do this and this and you can see it's a language and you can see, you can almost understand some of it because the gestures, a lot of them match what the words mean, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't really know it yet, but you don't, you could learn it, right? If you wanted to go take some classes, you could learn sign language. Well, the language of energy is that close to us that we can all learn it. Do you, you know? also teach us how to feel energy? Yeah, yeah, the whole, everything. Feel, see, hear, smell, taste, know, um, perceive in, in ways that maybe aren't those five senses. Yeah, I talk about that in the book because I know we all know how to do it and I give lots of exercises, things, you know, play with it, play with this and play with that in order to show you that, you know, if I give you the paints and I give you the paper, you can do something interesting. Uh, I discussed th this book with my colleague the other day, and she was trying to get her head around, you know, the red thread in it. 
And I said, well, it's kind of, you know, uh, it's a tool book for to look at energy and the body in multiple ways, in multiple ways to get to learn it. So <clears throat> if, in the Swedish, if, in, in any language, you have a, a kind of an alphabet. Every, every letter has, um, uh, every letter is different, but it has a certain energy to it Yes. Uh, depending on where in in a word for example the le the letter is so if it's in, in the beginning in the end or in the middle or in between you know consonants and vocals and stuff right right can you say that yeah. You, yeah. yeah and the same with with words you know i can say 10 random words and they'll make no sense but if i put them in the proper order they make a lot of sense they yeah. make a sentence as a matter of fact <clears throat> we know how to do this, to take building blocks and make sentences and make paragraphs and and communicate meaning. So in a way, it's playing with our own what I call the web of meaning, our own field of of meaning and how you make meaning in your life and I make meaning in my life. And our culture implies that everything has sort of a meaning out there. And that's not true. You know, I can show you any object, it's going to have a different meaning to you than it has to me. Yeah. Even though there's some commonality, like if I show you this, which is a handkerchief, and it's got polka dots on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to know it's got polka dots, and it's purple. And you know, it's going to mean different things to you than it means to me, even though we both might think, well, you could wipe your nose on it. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, no, I don't want to get it dirty. I'm going to use a Kleenex mm -hmm. and you'd save this because it's so pretty. Whereas you might say, no, I'll throw it. I'll use it and then throw it in the wash. Mm -hmm. Even even within what something is used for, we have different meaning. So mm -hmm. each of us is a meaning maker mm -hmm. and our life is richer the more we are capable of making our own meaning from our sensations and from our experiences and our perceptions and our interactions within the world, but also with ourselves. Yeah. And yeah. most of us sit around and wait for other people to tell us what, what yeah. something means. I think one of the biggest, the most, most important things that I take away from, from what we have talked about so far is, you know, it might seem easy what you're doing when you're playing around with energy and your body you're asking yourself stuff it might seem easy but it's the presence and the awareness to yourself that can actually get give you the answers that you want right right and show you the way to heal and yeah. show you the way to heal so it's um when we want to heal we're not healing the disease we're healing ourselves yeah. And the disease in English, if you take it apart, dis-ease means something has make, made us lost our ease, lose yeah. our ease. So how do we reclaim ease? Yeah. Not by looking at what's wrong, but looking for ease, looking for that ability to keep our energies moving and functioning and working well and supporting our creation of self. I mean, you're your own artwork, right? I'm my own artwork and everyone out there, you're amazing artworks. And you got to where you are because you've created that, you know, with some input from others, but often too much input from others and not enough recognition of the choices we're each making every moment. For so what recognition, recognition of what's happening within you and also an interest in yourself. Because right. if, if you focus on yourself, if you if you find an interest in yourself, how you're feeling, what's happening in your body, you're showing yourself respect. Yes, yes. And you're endlessly fascinating. I mean, really, we're all endlessly fascinating. <laughs> you know, and I'd like to do this little exercise where you think of all the people you know and and know about and you think, who would I rather be? Yeah. If you could give up yourself and be somebody else, would you do it? No. Most people say no. You know, I even, you know, I like my problems. I don't want your problems. I like my 
you know, I like my gifts. I don't want your gifts. Now, sometimes, yeah, we'd like to take on a few extra gifts, but usually that's because we have gifts that we don't yet use or recognize. It's not that we really want to be Mother Teresa. I mean, I don't want to live in Calcutta. <laughs> you know, I like Mother Teresa. I don't want to be her. I actually like living in comfort and having a bidet toilet, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so if you do that exercise, you come back to wait. No, I, I really do have a certain amount of commitment. And if I don't, then that's my first task is, is the, the journey to find out what's interesting about this person here. And if we base it on the feedback we've gotten from other people, you know, that's where a lot of self-hatred comes and too much negative feedback from people who just aren't connoisseurs and can't recognize what this soul is doing. No. But your soul can show you what it, what you want deep within. And so, you know, the spirit part can tell you through your body and through your mind what that sort of deeper truth is. And it's not one thing. It's it's an ever changing kaleidoscope mm -hmm. of energetic expression. But we're fascinating. Why wouldn't we want to, like, dive into the, you know, into the into the the Disneyland of ourself and find out what we can do here. Exactly. And I, you said something before that uh, is still with me. And you said, someone told you, if you just slow down, because I think that to me, it, it, you know, it resonates because we're just running, <laughs> we're running ahead of ourselves. And, oh, I have a, I got a cold, but I'm still running. I'm not feeling into it. And I wonder why do, why don't I ever get, um, get uh, well from this cold? Because yeah. I'm still running. I'm just, you know, it's something I don't have time to have pain. I don't have time to have a cold. I'm just right. keeping on running. Yeah. And the cold and the pain buy you time. You can call in sick. We can't call in well. You know, we can't call our employer and say, I am feeling so good today. I'm not going to come to work. I've got something better to do. You know, we have to have, I can't function. I'm sick. I don't feel well. I'll infect others so I can't come. And that's kind of backwards in my, in my mind. Uh -huh. But that's what illness, one thing illness does for us. It shows us what isn't happening that needs to happen. But we need to, yeah, sometimes some of us need to slow down mm -hmm. to hear it or perceive it. Some people, a few people need to speed up. <laughs> they need to get movement going. Um, okay. So you think about when you go to steer your car. If the car is perfectly still, you can't steer it. But if you get the car moving a little bit, you can steer it. So people who are stuck because they can't make a decision or they can't move in their life because they don't know where they want to go, just a little bit of movement, going for a walk, getting on a train, riding in a car, getting on a bike, or just walking um, around the house, that movement allows them to start to see where they want to steer and be able to do it more easily. So sometimes it's it's slow down sometimes it's a little speed up depending on the person but you need to know that what is your truest pace like on a scale of zero to ten what's your most comfortable first of all where are you normally where if ten is totally busy and overwhelmed and zero is comatose where do you normally live your life yeah you know and if you say eight nine then you can say, what's my most comfortable pace? Where, where am I happiest? Well, that's about a five, right? Some activity, you know, for, for a lot of people, but some it might be seven and some it might be two. And then, you know, my teachers once said, well, on the scale of zero to 10, for most people, healing pace is three. Oh. So if you can't get yourself down to three for an hour, you know, or for a night of sleep, it's very hard to heal because your body needs the resources to rebuild its tissue. And if you're using your resources to deal with stress, constant stress, you don't have those same resources to build tissue. Yeah. So we work with Makes pace sense. as part of the language, right? Yeah. And finding the balance. If you're normally a seven, eight, and then 
you need to heal on three, all of a sudden you're in balance. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, what do you do? You know, so you have to go to bed or you have, you know, you injure yourself. So you have to be at three. You can't run anymore. You hurt your leg or you fall down. You know, I was kind of, I was going to be like this big athlete, right? <laughs> All in the first time. And I just went, woo, and I fell over and it's like, okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe learn a little more about how to play the game before I try to like <laughs> be jumping for balls, whatever. So, um, do you have, yeah. do you have like a concrete, um, like a, a, a specific, uh, ex um, example of how the energy dialogue has helped you in life um of how it's helped my life i thought you were going to ask me to teach an exercise it's like yes I mean, that's the next question <clears throat> okay so how has it helped my life well um i had 15 years of daily migraines oh. and um i went to doctor after doctor after doctor and i should say they related also to metabolism problems. I, my family tends to have blood sugar issues and I had a blood sugar issue and I used food to console myself, particularly sweets. So I had, you know, a bunch of things going on and I didn't know how to inhabit this body, the care and feeding of this body. I was kind of a little head on a stick when I was a kid. I didn't know how to have a body. So I had to learn. And so for about 15 years, I had lots of imbalance and i went to doctor after doctor and got told you know try this do that try this and nothing worked very long and most of it created worse imbalance afterwards like some of the drugs caused other problems like intestinal imbalance so i had to finally learn that first of all i didn't have there's nothing there's no such thing as a migraine okay. migraine is a description of thousands of different situations that involve pain in part of your head and not even just your head. There's lots of other things. So I needed to have some dialogue with my body each time saying, what do you need today? What do you need now? And I have a technique. I, I don't think it's in this book. It's in the next one. <laughs> so I have to get that one translated um, where you ask that, that situation for a name, you know, not like, what's the the label but you know like ellen or alexander what's what's your name mm -hmm. and um so i'd ask my head what's what's the name of what's going on and it would say minerva minerva who's a goddess mm -hmm. but she's a goddess of just about everything she's like war and peace and wisdom and stupidity i mean she's got she's got conflicts built into them so funny name and then in english i think my nerve ah so I'm thinking, mm -hmm. oh, there's something with my nervous system and it's something to do with conflicts. Mm -hmm. So that alone gives me some insight that's more information than just, um, you know, what what's this migraine and what do I do with it? And then I talked to her, Minerva, what do you need right now? Mm -hmm. What do you need? And she'd say things like, my feet are all blocked and tight, massage my feet. So I would go and massage my feet or maybe put them in cold water if she said, my feet are too hot. So she would tell me bit by bit, and that would relieve the migraine, but it would also show me what was the condition that was created in the migraine. Mm. And I, you know, I have dozens of names for this thing that Western medicine calls migraines. That's how I use it. I dialogue over and over, but I don't always assume I know what, what the answer is. I ask really good questions and let my body show me with the language of energy, with images, with words, with sensations, with uh, gestures. It shows me in that language we've been talking about. And then I do something about it like and you would when someone the says what they need. And in the beginning, when when the energy language told you that it was your feet that caused the migraine, you would probably think, what? Yeah, except by that time, I was familiar enough with the fact that this whole body is part of the vocabulary, yeah. you know? And so I got the, the, the part of the vocabulary that was down in my feet. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because the top and the bottom as above, so below, it made some 
crazy logical sense to me. Yeah. And that's how I discovered that, wow, you can treat a headache by putting your feet in cold water mm -hmm. or massaging them. Often that's a really great way to treat a headache, what we call a headache. Yeah. It, so you have to just be open your senses and let whatever needs to come your way, come in your way. Yes, and you need to be willing to really listen and have dialogue rather than telling someone, telling your body what you think the right answer is. Yeah. But when you meet a new person, you don't know who they are. You ask them questions. Where are you from? What do you like to do? Who are you? You know, do you have a family? I'm not going to say, well, let me guess. You've got three children. Let me guess. You do that. You know, I mean, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I ask you? You know. Yeah. Right. So why wouldn't I ask my body? It knows what it needs. Yeah. And I don't. And the doctor certainly doesn't. Yeah. Right. So that's where it comes from. That's energy dialogue. It's very simple. It's something we do every day with language. We're just expanding it to a language that like sign language has a bigger or different kind of vocabulary, more extended mm -hmm. vocabulary. Do you want to to uh, teach us an exercise? I sure do. <laughs> I, there's a whole lot. The book is chock full of exercises because, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, I've learned a lot over the 38 years I've been doing this work. So I do try to share as much as I can, usually too much. And I do have a YouTube channel with a bunch of exercises as well. But this one I call Healing Hands. This is in the book, Healing Hands. And basically, you're going to rub your hands together. I've got to be soft. You can rub a little... I don't want to hurt this one. Rub your hands together just to activate the energy in them. You can also do this if you prefer or, or do the chi ball, whatever you do to activate energy in your hands. Then you have a beautiful healing hand. You say, where do you want to go? On my body, on my, you know, anywhere in my body or field, where do you want to go? So mine wants to go right here. Let it go where it wants to go. Just don't overthink it. And then you have another beautiful hand, healing hand. You say, where do you want to go? And mine wants to go down here. Okay, so you just hold and breathe and feel maybe the warmth or the, the touch of your hands or the tingling, whatever you feel, just tune into it. And just see what that feels like to you. And again, I say feel, but you might get images, you might hear words, you might hear music. You might just know something, or you might just let it talk. Let your hands talk to your body, because your hands speak fluent energy. So then, after a while, you're going to take one hand and say, do you want to stay where you are, or do you want to move somewhere else? So my hand wants to move from my neck to the back of my head. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ask your hand if it wants to stay, it can. And then you ask your other hand, do you want to stay there or do you want to move somewhere else? Mine, well, let's go up there. Well, yeah, I can reach. I'm going to switch them. Nope, that's better. Um, and so I'm just going to hold and again, feel into it. Listen in to what your hands are saying to your body and your energies. They speak fluent energy. If you don't know, then just feel it. I mean, you know, feel it maybe as warmth or just as touch. And then when you're ready again, you ask one hand, do you want to stay where you are or do you want to move somewhere else? And you ask the other hand, do you want to stay where you are? Do you want to move somewhere else? And you just keep doing this until you feel like you've come to the end of a conversation, the end of a process. And it can take two minutes, it can take 30 minutes, it can take whatever time you have, but it gives you a chance to have a little energy dialogue with your own body, with your hands that are very fluent. What did you feel? I mean, it was very short, I was talking, but what are you noticing about that for you? For me, I first of all, everything happens here. And I kind of understand, I, I think I understand why, because there's a lot 
going on up here and if I have problems I do have it with my neck or you know um, but also I, I it was easy for me to to see to see images colors and um, all of them talk to me so I could understand so okay yeah I get it why there is a mandala for example or lotus flower and uh, uh, I could also feel the heat and I felt very I felt um, how do you say when you're happy that you're actually with yourself yeah for a yeah. short time right right well and you can do it longer but yeah absolutely it's it's kind of it's so simple anyone can do it some people will say i didn't see anything i didn't hear anything i didn't know anything and that's <clears throat> that's fine because we train our brain over time to tune into these perceptions but your brain doesn't need to know in order for your hands to do a lot of healing work there's a tingling here in, in your palms as well yeah which is when we rub, rub it together we activate your healing that's built into the hands that and the the speech your hands speak like i always talk with my hands and i'm not even italian i talk with my hands but we all do to a certain extent we have gesture and it's it's a natural part so if i put my arms around you and i hold you your body feels it it does i don't have to say a word my hands will say it right or I put them on myself, my hands will say. It felt like, a, um, to me, I, I find it uh, sometimes difficult to meditate, but this kind of, uh, of exercise, it's very med meditative. Right, right. Because it's not about, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's not about, I mean, a lot of people learn meditation, but it's still a, me um, a mental practice. They're still up in their head, trying to notice everything. It's hard to stay in your head. If you're putting your hand on your knee, put your hand on your knee and feel your knee, feel your hand on your knee and feel your knee under your hand. It's very hard to translate that back to your head because there's a conversation happening there at your knee that's louder. So it's a, actually it's a form of full body meditation yeah. to use fraction for the mind to right. focus on the body yeah right it pulls you out of your brain into a vital conversation elsewhere in this amazing uh energy exchange that we are so you know if, if our culture tells us to live from here up mm -hmm. and this is a practice of allowing the whole being to be part of the conversation yeah and it makes us smarter. It's our whole mind, right? The mind is not just in the brain. It's in our whole body, in our energy field, in, in our spirit. I mean, you know, we're our mind is much bigger than our brain. So we're it's a it's a process of cultivating mind. So when they say mindfulness, it's real mindfulness, but it's it's the whole mind, including the mind in the body. The intelligence. Fantastic. So, Ellen, we have kind of uh, uh, overstepped our time limit here. I'm so sorry for that, but I have a few short questions for you. Okay. So, you live in California still? Yes, I still live in California. I'm in the Bay Area, which is up in the north near San Francisco. Oh, what, what's the kind of weather you have right now? Is it sunny and warm or? It's it's sunny and it's um, it's about what, 60s, which I can't translate into Celsius really quickly, but um, probably. Do you have a jacket on? Huh? You, do you have a jacket on when you go out? Um, a light jacket, but I don't like to be cold. Just a sweater is fine. It's sweater weather. Yeah, oh, nice. it's sunny. Oh. Good. That's good for you. We're just about to have the spring sun here. Oh, lovely. Yes. Yeah. California stays sunny all year round. And in Northern California, it does get a little cooler. We don't have snow or anything like that where we are. We're supposed to have rain, 
but right now we're having a lot of drought, so it's pretty much sunny most days and and it's it's comfortable. It's not not terribly cold. Nice for you. <laughs> so, uh, what's Sorry. your family situation? Do you, do you have um, yeah, how does your family look like? Well, I live here with my wife and my two cats. Mm -hmm. And um we have uh let's see, we have two children who are grown and um five I have to I'm looking in my head like I can remember five grandchildren. Oh. And uh you know, lots of sisters and uh, yeah, sisters <laughs> and one brother. And so extended family, but my family's spread all over the country and um so but here in this area we have a couple uh, sisters and nieces and cousins and things. So because you moved to California in your adult life. Where are you yeah. from? Okay, I've moved back and forth. Um, we have moved a lot. So um, we moved, I've talked about moving to California that first time. I, I moved out here for a teaching job and I moved back to um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where I went to school and grew up. And then, um, let's see, I went off to Switzerland no, then I went back to California. Then I went to Switzerland uh, to be with my partner who had a job in Switzerland at the time. And then we moved to Massachusetts. And then we moved to the Netherlands. Mm. And then we moved to Canada, British Columbia, you know, three, four, seven years in each of these places. And then we moved down to San Diego in California and then back up here. So we've lived a lot. We, I've lived abroad about uh, 15 to 20 years of my life. So lots of back and forth, uh, between here and Europe. And, um, my partner worked internationally and so did I, uh, on child development, international child development. So we did a lot of travel to Africa and South America and Asia, various places, um, working on advocacy for young children. That was a second, second career that I did for a while. I don't do it anymore. It sounds a lot of fun, though. It was interesting. And it taught me to think about about human development. I talk about that in the book. There's a lot on child development and how kids develop language, because that was also where I did a lot of work. Yeah. Interesting. So um, what's your zodiac sign? I'm a Gemini. Are you interested in astrology? Yes, but I'm not. I, I know it, but I'm not terribly knowledgeable. I have kind of a casual street knowledge of it. So, you know, I've had my chart done multiple times and, you know, know some things about it, but um, I'm not an expert. No. Same here. But I, I think it's fascinating, though. What's yours? Uh, Taurus. Taurus. Okay, that makes some sense. <laughs> yes. How, how come? Um, because your energy is very grounded because um, your energy looks like you can take a task and really pursue it step by step to beginning to end and really kind of figure out how you're going to, to make it unfold and make it happen because you're in work that takes something and makes something else, you know, that, that gets it out to people. That, that's all kind of Taurus kind of energy in my mind. You know a lot about the Zodiacs. <laughs> Just the, just a little about the vocabulary, right? Of what each of the, what the energies are of each of the signs and all. Oh, so what's the the vocabulary of the Gemini? Oh, Gemini. Well, first of all, we're twins, so there's always a duality. Like if one thing is true, maybe its opposite is also true. Um, Gemini's like to jump around and play. We're all about um, communication. I have a lot of Gemini and Mercury, which is communication in my chart. So everything in my chart is all about communication. Um, and what else about Gemini? Um, Geminis are youthful. You know, we get old, but we still act young, um, which is sometimes a little embarrassing when people, you know, you're in your 60s. I'm, I'm like 66 and people still go, oh, honey, how are you? You know, <laughs> it's like, well, it's Gemini energy. It's that youthful energy. That sounds good. <clears throat> yeah, and Geminis are messengers, so very much that fits who and what I am in life. Yeah, you are definitely. So, do you have a motto in life? Do I have what? A motto, like a life motto, or 
No, I don't. But I have a life purpose, which is my goal is to help people hear their inner truth and find their gifts. And that's kind of what my work is all about. I guess that's kind of a motto. Yes, definitely. Because somewhere it started, maybe it started with you. Yeah, yeah. I think it always has to start with you. I think that if you don't inhabit and know your own instrument, how are you going to play in an orchestra with other people? You know, you really have to master or or become proficient with this instrument in order to play the music of your soul. And when you do, then you start to see who can I play with? Who can I collaborate with to make larger music or better um better culture, better shared culture. So absolutely starts with the self. Yes, so true. What do you love to eat? Everything. No, <laughs> I love food. I, my element in Chinese medicine is very much earth element. I have earth and fire are my two primary elements. And um, <clears throat> so earths do love food. I love to eat, I love to cook, but I particularly like sour things like pickles. And salty things, I love salt, lots of salt. And I like uh, I like sweet things. So like I say, I pretty much, I like lots of stuff. <laughs> That's good. You know, food and things that you eat, it, it makes life uh, a bit more fun. <laughs> right, right. I sort of feel like we only have so many meals before we die and we have to make them count. <laughs> Definitely. So what do you love to do? You love to cook. What yeah. else do you love to do? Writing. I love to write. Yeah, everything. I mean, this is I I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but all of my a lot of my hobbies have to do with language. I I like learning languages and speaking them. I love travel and meeting and and seeing different cultures and exploring cultures. I I love um literature, poetry, so reading is my favorite activity. I just love to read um and write both. And uh, what else do I like? I like people. I like laughing. It's one of my favorite, you know, just to sit around and laugh with people. I just think that's a great evening spent is, you know, so I like humor in many forms. I like to make jokes. I like to hear jokes. Uh, what else do I like? Um, <clears throat> I like good artwork of all sorts. I, you know, I like visual art. I love looking at it and I'm not very good making it, but I don't care. I like making it just, I don't mind making a mess because I, you know, I don't have expectations that I'm good, but I like making any form of art. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Is that enough? <laughs> that is enough. That's quite a bunch. You know, some people have a hard time actually expressing what they like to do. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I talk about that in the book, um, I think. I talk about how little kids have what I call a glee factor. They have the, pot the potential for joy and enjoyment, but it has to be developed like a muscle. So if you grow up in a house that's too stressed out or where there's alcoholism or where it's not safe to enjoy and to take in and to express joy, it's a it's an underworked muscle. And sometimes that's part of the healing that has to take place. And I talk about that. I give some examples in the book of people who had to learn it and how they learned it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't you know, I think that everyone has the capacity, but it's not always as well developed as it should be. That's a very and really. Point. And I think in in our lives where we're so busy, even though we have a, a healthy family and good relationships maybe we forget to to make space right right well you know it's interesting to me to look at how people eat because sometimes it tells me a lot about how they deal with energy so if they just shovel the food in and they barely chew it and they barely taste it and they you know they just kind of either put in as much as they want can or they just eat it, but they distract by watching TV or doing other things. I ask them, is this how you take in love? Is this how you take in a beautiful sunset? Is this how you experience life? Like when you see a beautiful sunset, what do you do? And a lot of people say, I pull out my camera and take a picture so I can share it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to ask, well, where in that process do you also take it in for yourself? 
Do you look at the picture and share it with yourself? Or do you actually see the sunset? Do we taste the food? Do we take the time to break it down and prepare it for our body? Or do we rush through our experiences? How do we walk through the everyday experiences? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and part of that living meditation that you and I were talking about is, you know, don't always just do it on automatic. You know, when I brush my teeth, am I really cleaning my teeth or am I just do, 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 and at, at high speed where I'm not cleaning my teeth, I'm doing this thing I forced myself to, you know, I've told myself I have to do. So how can you learn to do what you do and take it in that you're doing it? Know that you're doing it. Bring in joy yeah. from doing it. I get this picture of an Italian family eating dinner around a table, you know, um, talking while chewing and, you know, severing the food and having the style. That kind of uh, dinner setting is so, well, it's something that I want more of. Yeah. And I think a lot of times you, you don't enjoy your meal. Right. Right. And we need to know for ourselves what what we need in order to enjoy. Like for me, I don't taste my food as well if I'm eating with other people because I'm overstimulated by the other person. I I want to talk. I want to hear what they think. I you know, their energy kind of distracts me. So I'm not as focused on what does that taste like? Do I like it? Is it speaking to me? Am I hungry for this? Mm -hmm. So I actually personally have learned that occasionally I need to just eat, sit down, think what I really want and eat alone and have that experience mm -hmm. without other stimulation. But that's me. Other people, the opposite is true, that if they're too much alone, they can't enjoy, They it feels too heavy and weighted. So everybody's different. Very true. Well, Ellen, thank you so much. I think that we have a, a full hour and a little bit more of fantastic um, information and a wonderful atmosphere here with you. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to, to speak with you. It's wonderful to meet you finally. And thank you for taking such good care of my book and getting it out there in Swedish. I love that. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. Because I know that you have been, we have had contact during this process of the book. And um, you have been so quick in answering all the questions that we've had and stuff like that. So that's very appreciative. Oh, sure. I'll always love a good question. <laughs> Anyway. A good question. Yeah, that, that's where all this that we've been talking about, it actually ends up with good questions. I think so. I think if you develop the art of asking yourself better questions, you're going to have a better life. If you just stick with what's wrong, you're going to have a life full of what's wrong. And if you ask yourself, you know, how can I thrive? Where's a gift I can bring in? You know, can I give you a gift? Can I receive a gift? Whatever we can do to ask better questions, we're going to get better information and better experience. That's so true. So we should change all the problem questions or, yeah. Right. Just be aware that if our, that our cultural tendency is always to focus on what's wrong, how do I fix it? Yeah. If we can just heal that and say what's needed and how can I cultivate it, yeah. we're going to have a very different life. Yes. Thank you very much, Ellen, and I hope that we will hear from you again. Thank you. It's been wonderful speaking with you, and bye to all of you in the club. I hope you enjoy the book. Take care. Bye.